Good morning. What a great reminder of what Jesus did for us so that we could be free. Praise God. Praise God. Today we're back in the book of Luke, as you may have guessed. One of the smallest passages in the Bible is, remember Lot's wife. How many of you know her name? Lot's wife. I have such trouble remembering names. Lot's wife is no different. And so there are some names that I've written down that I, I want to highlight. Pat and Kim Hoffman. Why don't you guys stand up and be embarrassed? Uh, Sue Chejusho. Why don't you stand, stand up, Sue? And Noah Banta. These three have completed membership classes and have consented, strangely, to be members of Grace Bible Fellowship Church. And to seal the deal, we actually have uh, a couple of baptisms coming up to seal the deal. So keep your ears open for that. Um, I'm going to try to find a hotel. You can sit down now, brother. I'm sorry. I It's so good to see fresh new faces come in, hearing the word of God and growing and finding our fellowship rich and um, deep and loving. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. It's probably more the food after service, but the rest of it's not too bad. The book of Luke. Jesus is going to tell us about his second coming. He's going to tell us about the rapture of the church. He's going to tell us about the day of the Lord. He's going to use all of these terms talking about his second coming in which we are on the edge of our seats waiting on. Amen? Amen. Especially with recent current affairs and the way things are going, it's not getting any better. Just when the coronavirus was behind us. And so we're going to look at the coming kingdom that Jesus mentions. Last week, we looked at the 10 lepers that were healed. Jesus in the, in the flat out presence of all these religious leaders, including his disciples, these 10 lepers come up. He's going through Galilee and they come up and they cry out for mercy on the son of man, who's one of the terms of Jesus. It's used in the book of Daniel. Have mercy on us. And they cry out and he goes, show yourself to the priest. And they do it. It seems a bit rude. You know, he didn't, pronounce any magical words, you know, he didn't make any symbols and, you know, repeat anything in Latin. There was no homina homina, there was nothing. He just said, turn around, go show yourself to the priests, which they did. And as they went, they were healed. What a great principle as we're obedient to God, that God does the work that he ultimately wants to do in our life. And one of them was overwhelmed to the point where he turned around and he ran back to Jesus to thank him and to worship at his feet. By the way, angels don't accept worship. Only God accepts worship, which is quite suspicious, or maybe not. And so Jesus says, isn't there anyone else? What happened to the nine? And the question we ask ourselves is, am, am I one of the 10 or am I one of the nine? Am I the one that God has done a work in and I just turn around and go about my business? Or do I have enough time to worship and say thank you? And I realize that I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here worshiping and saying thank you. But it's not a common attitude. And we talked about cultivating a heart of thankfulness. As the leper came back, Jesus said, well, where are the nine? Well, they went about their business. I want to be one of the 10. How about you? Yeah. I want to be thankful. So today... We're going to talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ in which he's promised and explained. The passage we go over today is chapter 17, verses 20 to 37. I know it's communion Sunday and we probably aren't going to get through it all. So don't be too disappointed, Jenna. Uh, already? Okay. Verse 20. 
Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. And then he said to his disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the son of man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here, look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part of heaven shines in the other part of heaven, so also the son of man will be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things to be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate and they drank, they married wives, notice the plural, and were given in marriage until the days that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out, to, out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he was on the housetop and his goods are in the house. Let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, that night there will be two men in one bed. One will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. One will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be in a field. One will be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said to him, where, Lord? So he said to them, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Good. Very good. So Jesus is coming again. The Pharisees asked him when the kingdom of God would come. If you remember... Jesus just healed 10 lepers. Boom. One came back in front of the Pharisees, proving he was healed. And the Pharisees, blind as they were, press Jesus and say, when is the coming kingdom going to arrive? Well, there was the king <laughs> exercising authority casting out demons, healing people of leprosy, which had never been done. So why didn't they see that the kingdom of God was there? Why didn't they see the king himself as having arrived? You see, they're asking a question that just seems so out of this world. We, we look at it kind of in separate little chunks, but this is right after Jesus performed a miracle in their very face. And they say, when is the kingdom of God would come? And they didn't ask him in a nice way. It says they asked, they were asked by the Pharisees. They weren't asked by the Pharisees. He was pressed. He was given an interrogation by the Pharisees. They were giving it to him. Like they put him in a chair and put a light on him and said, where were you on the night of the fifth? You know, that's the kind of tone that they use. And that's what the original language says. When the kingdom of God would come. And he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. <laughs> it, it's kind of like, you know, they say a watched pot never boils. You know, you put the, you put the stove on and you stand there and you look at it. <laughs> it's not going to boil because you're looking at it. You realize that, right? And as long as you're looking at it, it won't boil. That's just the nature of it. And Jesus says here, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. 
that's rather interesting because they're not being very observant because there's the king in their very presence exercising authority, which the kingdom of God was among them or in their midst and right in front of them. But they couldn't see him. It's a little like, hey, look at the forest. And you go, where? So I can't see the forest because of all the trees. Jesus is the kingdom of God. He's exercising kingship. There's the kingdom of God. It's right in front of your face and you don't even see it. Like the forest through the trees. So they interrogated these religious rulers, Jesus, and the timing of the kingdom of God. And he said, you will never see it with a critical eye, which they were being very critical with Jesus because they got a big old log in there. They're not going to see anything. And it's not going to be in a geographical location. And he gets into it a little in the latter verses when he talks about the various people and what they'll be doing. It's not going to be in any certain location. Like if you're not on a mountaintop, you're going to miss it. You don't, you don't have to worry you're going to miss the rapture because you're, you're not in the right place. But the kingdom of God is one of those things that is within you, which is an interesting and, and probably unfortunate transliteration because it actually means in your midst or among you. And certainly he's speaking to the Pharisees. He's not saying the kingdom of God is in them, is he? Because the kingdom of God is not in them. And he's speaking to them. The kingdom of God is in your midst. It probably is the, the best translation of that word. It means among you. Like, hello, here I am. And they didn't see him. Make sense? Certainly the kingdom of God is in you, but it wasn't in the Pharisees. And that's who he's directing it to. The kingdom of God is in you and you see it and you understand it because you've been born again. And that's how it is that you see the kingdom of God according to John chapter 3 and Jesus said it. In Luke eleven fourteen, 14, if you remember, Jesus mentioned something else about the kingdom. He was casting out a demon and it was mute. So it caused this person to not be able to communicate. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. And Jesus says here in verse 20, but if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. You see, Jesus was announcing himself as the king and announcing that he is exercising the authority of the kingdom. Understood? Amen. You guys got that? Okay. Because it could be a little misunderstood sometimes. Romans 14, 17 says that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom of God is. And that's what is defined for us in Romans. The kingdom of God is about walking in his authority, walking under his authority and walking in the joy of the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. How many in the kingdom? Okay. Don't look so glum. <laughs> verse 22. And he said to his disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the son of man. He's speaking of himself, the son of man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here, look there. Just like the previous verses, do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines in the other part of heaven, so also the son of man will be in his day. So he says, there's a day coming when you're going to look for me, guys, and I'm not going to be here. And you're going to wish you could be back with me again. Can you imagine hearing that as a disciple following Jesus and living with him and traveling with him and him announcing the fact that there's going to be a time when you wish I was around. Now, who's he speaking to? His disciples. If you're a disciple, he's speaking to you too. Don't you wish Jesus was here? Yes. It would make it a whole lot easier, wouldn't it? Yes. I think it would. Because there are a lot of questions I have. Have you got some of those? Yes. Why is a big one. <laughs> but we won't have any of those questions when we see him because we'll, we, we will kn we'll know all things even as we are fully known, the scripture says. I'm looking forward to that. In John 16, verses 19 to 22, it says, now, Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? And then he repeats what he said. 
a little while and you will not see me, and again, a little while and you will see me? Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she's in labor, she has sorrow because of her hour has come. No feminine voices saying amen. <laughs> but as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have this sorrow. He's talking to a bunch of men, by the way. But I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. So Jesus is reiterating, there's a time in which he's going to go. He will be sacrificed on the cross. He will die. He has to, because there's no other way that our sins will be washed away, except for the sacrifice of a perfect lamb, God himself, the God man, Jesus Christ. And he says, and they will say to you, look here, look there. Do not go after them. Because there are going to be lots of people who are false prophets. There are people who call themselves Christians, call themselves pastors even, or call themselves the right reverend whatever. They'll call themselves whatever, but they're not. Just because you call yourself something or because you got a piece of paper on the wall doesn't mean you're anything. It's God who calls people. In Matthew 7.15, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. You know how you can tell a wolf from a sheep? Sheep eat grass. Wolves eat sheep. <laughs> so, you, you find a particular person who claims to be a Christian, and yet they devour sheep? And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. The scripture says, look out for false teachers, because they're going to come. False prophets who will try to tell you that they exclusively have the truth that no one else has. And it's much more than what's written in your scriptures. You know, that's a lie, right? If it doesn't, if it's not backed up in the scriptures, then the scriptures aren't wrong. In 1 John 4, 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You guys know that that's the truth, right? Yep. Here's one for you, because I'm not afraid. Anyone who tells you to deny yourself is from Satan according to Paula White, who's a female preacher on the TV. And here in Matthew 16, 24, it says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. It's a pretty straightforward opposite what the Scripture says, right? The Scripture says, Jesus tells us, test the spirits. Don't just accept everything. Oh, wow. Well, it's on TBN. It must be right. Or it was on the internet. It's got to be true. Or it was on the news. You guys know better, right? In Revelation 20, verse 10, it says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And by the way, that's not a parable. That's a literal statement. There is a literal place in which people will go because they've rejected God's only sacrifice for our sin. Not because they're this, that, or the other thing. That doesn't send you to hell. What sends you to hell is you don't have a savior. You don't have a sacrifice for your sin. Amen? Because we're all sinners. But I'm sinning less all the time. But I don't think I'll ever be sinless. In fact, I'm pretty sure of it until the Lord takes me home. Well, you got Ken Copeland, very strange looking human being, who says this, hey, you know what Jesus told me? He told me I could be the savior of the world. <laughs> Any of you see anything wrong with that? 
he was once questioned by a reporter about his lavish lifestyle and everything, and, and that's, that's the loving response that she got as she approached him. And then he realized he was on camera and he suddenly struck a cheesy smile. Test the spirits because there are false prophets and do not follow them, Jesus says. Agreed? Yep. We're good? Okay. Or, now, here's a guy for you. Yes, and they will be able to deceive even the elect if that were possible, the scripture says. They will come with miracles. They will come with all sorts of things, and yet, are they a wolf? Well, let me see. Do they eat sheep? When your pastor is a billionaire and the people who put money in your plate aren't, you're eating sheep. which is why I will never have a brand new Mercedes Benz. <laughs> and then he said to his disciples, there's a day coming. And as the lightning that flashes out of one part of heaven and shines to the other part under heaven, so also the son of man will be in his day. He says it will be like lightning. It won't be this secretive, quiet raining like the Jehovah witnesses would tell you that the, Jesus is coming again, and we got a date and a time, and that's a big problem already. They, they said, well, he came, you just missed it. He came quietly. He came kind of, you know, like on the, on the down low. Well, that's, that's in complete conflict with what the Bible teaches, what Jesus himself says here in Luke. Don't let anybody deceive you. Don't follow the false prophets analyze this stuff, test the spirits to see if they're from God. It doesn't matter if there are miracles. It doesn't because, you know, Satan can do miracles, can he? Mm -hmm. And there are going to be people that go, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we? And he's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. It's much more about the integrity of your life and, and who you belong to than how showy it is that you do for the Lord, right? So it's going to be like lightning in the sky. It will be overt, visible, shocking, unmistakable, undeniable, not subtle, not secret, and not silent. So anybody that tells you is any of those things is not reading the scripture. They're deceived. Do not follow them. They're false. Amen? All right. I'm coming out strong today here, guys. But first... Jesus says, before all of this, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Isn't it interesting that Jesus talks about his second coming in terms of generations? It's not in days or months or years. He's saying generations. This generation has to reject me first. We see it written of long before Jesus ever came in Isaiah 53 that he would be despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement or the punishment of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. And as was as a lamb, and, and as was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He didn't come up with a, a, a witty defense, although he could have. He didn't speak power and knock a bunch of people down. He could have. He could have called 10,000 angels and they would have fought for him. And he didn't do it. He was quiet. 
like a lamb led to the slaughter because he was the lamb of God and he was slaughtered so that you and I might have life. We've been ransomed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus is going to liken his second coming unto the time of Noah. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it also will be the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, and were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Notice the flood didn't come while Noah was preparing the boat. Notice the flood didn't come in the middle of him making the boat. It came after Noah was securely tucked inside and in a safe place and the water then was able to lift him up and he was taken to a place of safety while God poured out his judgment on the world. And Jesus said, it will be like that when the Son of Man comes. You and I would be in the place of Noah. The rest of the world will be under God's wrath and under his judgment. And he says, that's what it's going to be like. Jesus likened it unto that. If you remember the story in Genesis, it says, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, that he was grieved in his heart. All you have to do is look at your phone, look at the news, and look at what's going on in the Ukraine. Does it grieve your heart? Yes. Makes me feel a little guilty that I'm in a, a room that has electricity and that I can use running water in the bathroom and I can eat a meal. Pray for these people. Pray for the Russian people too because they're a victim of a violent dictator who I think is possessed by Satan. It's like Hitler all over again. Pray for the Russian people. Pay, pray for the Ukrainian people. But you see, God was sorry that he had made man. He was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. <coughs> Everybody tries to make their father proud of them, right? I mean, what does it take to say, you know what, I'm, I'm so grieved. But it said that every thought and every intention of man's heart was continually evil all the time. That's a serious addiction. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. By the way, this is the first time grace is mentioned in the Bible. Noah found grace, God's unmerited favor. In Genesis 8, 20 to 22, it says, and Noah built an altar to the Lord. This is after the flood, after everybody was gone. He sends the birds out. He waits seven days. And finally, he, he gets the idea, okay, it's safe to come out. He gets ready to come out, comes out. Everything's dried up. And of course, he's on an elevated plane. And uh, I had a picture of Noah's Ark, but I, I didn't put it up here. An actual picture of the real site. It's in Turkey. It's up on the mountain. It's really, really there, guys. And you can check it out. You got smartphones, right? Everybody get on your... No, don't do that. <laughs> Noah built an altar to the Lord, and he took every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. That's why he had more than two of everything, because he planned on making sacrifice. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And by the way, it's not that he enjoys the barbecue. That's the smell of obedience. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, true, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. It's actually a little poem. I didn't sing it for you, but it is. God said, as long as the earth remains, everything's going to be okay, until he wipes it out, of course. And it won't be by water this time, it'll be by fire. So don't worry about global warming, we're okay. <laughs> Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, and they bought and sold, and they planted and built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day the Son of Man is revealed. 
So it's like Lot. You remember Lot? Of course you do. Talked to him last week, I'm sure. <laughs> but before Lot, you remember that there were three men, so they're called, that came to see Abraham. They just happened to be on their way to Sodom, coincidentally. These guys were so awesome that Abraham got on his face and he said, please stay. I want to make you a meal. I want to hang out and, you know, catch up, see what's going on. Please don't leave. Let me, let me serve you. And they, they said, okay. They sat down and he made a meal and there was some prophecy that happened. Eventually it comes up. What are you doing? Well, going to Sodom. Oh, yeah? My nephew lives there. Yeah, we know. <laughs> They're going to go destroy the city. So the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. How many went to Sodom? Two. We know that two angels go to Sodom because we, if you read on ahead, there are two that enter Sodom. There's one that he's calling the Lord, who's sticking back and having a conversation with Abraham. Ooh. Abraham came near and said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous that were in it? That's a good question. Would God punish the righteous and the wicked all at the same time? And there was silence that day. Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous and the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Who's he calling the judge of all the earth? The Lord who he's talking to. So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their six. The principle we learn is God will not wipe out the righteous with the wicked. Like Noah. Like Lot. You get that? Serious principle. You got to go with the principle before you move on. Genesis 18, 32 to 33 says, and he said, let not the Lord be angry. Because he says, what if there's 40? What if there's 30? What if there's 20? And he gets him down to 10. Let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak but once more. This is, this is what people do when they knock on my door in my office. They're like, I'm so sorry. Can, can I come in? I, I, the building's burning. I don't mean to bother you. But, you know, like, I will speak but once more. Suppose 10. Suppose 10 would be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. Apparently, Abraham was done with his whittling down and negotiating. And so the Lord went his way. As soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. So before the two angels get to Sodom, he's having this give and take with the Lord saying, certainly you would not destroy the righteous and the wicked in the same act. And he says, no, you're right, I wouldn't. Not if there's 50, not if there's 40, not if there's 30, not if there's 20, not if there's 10. You done? I'll bet you he would have gotten down to one and said, I will not destroy the city for the sake of one righteous person. I'm willing to bet, because guess how many people got delivered who were righteous out of that city? I'm leading the witness. Yes, one. It was a family of four. Genesis 19, 12 to 14 says, And the man said to Lot, have you want anyone else here? When the, when the two angels, the messengers, got to the town, they went and asked Lot, say, who do you got? What's the result of your ministry here? You know, you're a, you're a righteous man. You kind of went, you were outside of Sodom for a while, then you went near the gate, and then you opened your tent towards Sodom, and then suddenly you're in the city gate. You're a big deal. You're, you know, you're one of the council members now. So how's your ministry doing? Who do you have? Oh, well, there's my wife. There's my two daughters. And, 
and their sons, or, or soon to be, or their uh, husbands. Okay. All right. You've been a missionary in this town, and that's what you got. <laughs> okay. Let's deal with that. Have you anyone else? Sons-in-law, your sons, your daughters, whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out, and he spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up! Get out of this place! The Lord will destroy the city! But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. Old man, go home. But his daughters go with him. I think that's interesting. They seem a little unevenly yoked, in my opinion. And when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while they lingered, the men took hold of his hand and his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters. That's a lot of hands. And the Lord, being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. Notice he didn't go willingly. Neither did his daughters, neither did his wife. They had to grab his hand and forcibly carry him away. So it came to pass, and when they brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. And Lot had a problem with that because he was a city boy. And he goes, Oh, no. Oh, no, no. If I go into the woods, I'm, something's going to happen. I know it. I just know it. I'm going to get devoured by a bear, by a cheetah, I don't know, an angry sloth. It could be anything. I, I, don't, I, I can't go there. Hey, there's a little city over here. Why don't I go there? It's a little city. It's a teeny little city. It, and they called it Zor, which means little. And that's what they named the city from then on was Zor, which means little. Yeah, it's, it's a little city. Can't, can't we go there? And the, the angel says to him, hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Why? Because God will not punish the innocent with the guilty. Right? Just wondering if you're picking up what I'm laying down. Jesus said, as in the time of Lot, it will be when I come again. You're going to be forcibly taken away and brought to a place of safety before the judgment happens. Escape, therefore, I cannot do anything until you arrive there. That sounds like a principle. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zor, which means little, which I told you already. I, sometimes I do that. Peter got it right. In 2 Peter 2, 4 and 9, For God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness. He's talking about the disobedient ones, the fallen angels. To be reserved for judgment, and he did not spare in the ancient world, but saved Noah. It's interesting, he's going to pick up the same two characters in this verse. Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterwards would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot. So he's got Lot and Noah both in the same category, who was oppressed by a filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then, here's the principle, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. If God can take care of Noah and if God can take care of Lot, God can take care of you. And if he's going to take us out of here and pour out his judgment, that's very consistent with what he's done in the past. And one of the ways that you interpret scripture is you find those things that you're sure of and that you understand and that you know from the past, and you apply them to things that maybe you scratch your head and say, I don't know. 
Well, this tells me that God is righteous and he doesn't destroy the righteous with the wicked. It tells me that he's already done it for Noah and for Lot. Jesus says it will be just like Noah. It will be just like Lot. Any of you understand? You get it? That's why I believe the Lord is going to take us home before he pours out his wrath on this world. And aren't you glad? Heck yeah. So, Peter got it right. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together to him. By the way, there's a difference between the Lord coming down to the earth and there's a difference between us going to him. There's two stages here. Just thought I'd show you. One, the Lord's going to put his foot on the Mount of Olives and it's going to crack and that's the Lord coming down. That's a different deal. But when the Lord pulls us up is another way, another thing. The gathering together to him. We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. You see, these guys were afraid. They were in the midst of the tribulation. Rome was going nuts. Christians were dying, and they're like, we missed the bus. Jesus took his people home, and he and didn't pick us up. We're in the middle of the tribulation. And he said, don't get too excited. You, you didn't miss anything. As though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means that the day will not come unless the falling away first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God or he pretends he's God. Do you not remember this, that when I was still with you, I told you these things? By the way, he was only with the Thessalonians for a few weeks, and he taught them eschatology. The, the, the end things and the coming of the Lord. He goes, don't you remember this? These guys are all worried. Oh no, the Lord came back and took a bunch of people. It must be because it's like we're in the tribulation. There's stuff going on. He goes, listen, there wasn't a great falling away yet. This person of, of sin who's the antichrist has not been revealed yet. So take it easy. You're, you're not in the tribulation. Make sense? Okay. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, he says, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. Who's he talking about? Who is the one who restrains God's judgment? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God in you. Isn't that nice to know? Because you're the salt of the earth. You're the preservative of this place. Now you know what is restraining and that he may be revealed in his own time. That's the Antichrist. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he, the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way. And when the lawless one will be revealed, notice it's after the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy in the brightness of his coming, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. So who's being deceived? Those who perish. Those are the ones who will be deceived because we already believe. Nobody's going to pull the wool over your eyes, right? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. That's why people perish, because they didn't receive the love of Jesus Christ. The reason people go to hell is not because of whatever particular sin you can name. And there's no sin greater than another. It's all disobedience to God. The reason that you don't go to heaven is because you don't have a Savior, because you haven't been forgiven, because your sins haven't been covered, you haven't been born again, you're not a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things have not been made new. So it doesn't matter your particular sin. Good? Yeah. I'm moving on. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion. He's going to send those who are deceived already. A strong delusion so that they should believe the lie. That they all may be condemned 
who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, if you're not going to believe the truth, God's going to let a lie come that you'll believe because you're already deceived, you're already lost, you're already perishing. So he's going to give you overwhelming proof that what you believe, if you're perishing, is true. I, I believe, Pastor Dave, that there are UFOs. Okay, I believe you're going to have a powerful delusion. I believe in spirits that inhabit things. Okay, I believe you're going to have a powerful delusion. And it's going to be confirmed. Well, I believe that all roads lead to God. I believe you're going to have a powerful delusion. Because the scriptures are clear and Jesus has demonstrated his power. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. We're at a time... You see, I prophetically mentioned that Jenna would be disappointed. <laughs> Guys, reading the Bible line at a time and going through it in its context as Jesus is laying it out for us is the best way to study the Bible. It is so easy to get completely whacked out by surfing the internet and listening to people tell you what they think it says. Read the book. It is the most enlightening, most helpful, most spiritually healthy thing that you can do is read the Bible. It will tell you lots of bad things about you. And you need to hear that. And it will tell you all the great things about Jesus Christ and all of the things that we have in him. And guys, God loves us like he does a bride. And trust me, he is going to protect his bride before he pours out wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. Don't forget Lot's wife. Mm -hmm.